Do you think you have a say in the future of big oil corporations? You may not know, but chances are that you do. If you have an investment in a retirement fund where you work, you're likely owning a small share of a big oil or gas corporation. You are the owners. And as an owner, you have a power to change what a company does. Investors, the owners of oil and gas companies, can make a key difference in shifting these companies' investments from fossil fuels to low-carbon alternatives, and thereby playing a powerful role in tackling climate change. The key point that I want to make here is that a lot of these investors are based in rich countries in the United States, including in this room. Now, you may have heard of divestment, jettisoning the dirty part of your asset portfolio, right? Now, that's a powerful symbolic gesture. You're getting rid of it. You don't want to have it. However, there's also an alternative strategy. Stay in the game and use your stake to push companies to change what they're doing. It's not just an et ethical motivation that should drive you, but it's a, it's a hard business case. You want that company to go with the times because it's supposed to turn a profit in 10, 20, 30 years. Your retirement is not tomorrow, it's maybe in 20, 30, maybe even further in the future. And you want those investments to be valuable then. So oil and gas companies need to make prudent business decisions now to ensure that they stay profitable over all of this time horizon. To illustrate why this involves moving beyond their core business of digging up and selling oil and gas, let me introduce the, uh, the concept of stranded assets. A stranded asset is something that you invest in or you buy because you think it's going to give you all of these returns in the future. But once you've bought it, you realize, whoa, it's, uh, it's actually worth nothing. It, it's worthless. Your expectations change. So, so here's an example that already came up. You know, do you still remember CDs, DVDs? Who of you still has a DVD burner at home? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and who still uses it? Uh, yeah, I see a few stranded assets belong to people in this room, right? I mean, you bought this thing thinking, my God, I'm going to share all these amazing contents with my friends or colleagues. And along came high-speed internet, and everything was just shared through the cloud. You stream movies, you download softwares. I mean, worst case, you share something over a USB stick, right? And then you erase it. So unfortunately, that DVD burner that you invested in, thinking it would give you all these future returns, if not monetary, then it, you know, at least in feeling good about your experiences, uh, turned out to be a stranded asset. Now, oil and gas companies have a lot of really big, heavy physical assets out there that are at risk of stranding if society moves away from fossil fuels. That involves oil refineries, offshore oil platforms, pipelines, oil and gas field service equipment, and a variety of other large, expensive, physical assets. Now, as an owner of these companies, you don't want that company to buy or construct these kind of assets if they become worthless after a few years, even though they were built to last and generate profits for multiple decades. That would just be bad business. And so with a low carbon future around the corner, Building out new oil and gas fields now is likely to generate exactly these kinds of stranded assets a few years down the road. But you might say, hey, wait, you know, those are not my assets. Aren't all of these activities mostly in, you know, far away, in the Middle East, in OPEC countries? No, they aren't. Research by my co-authors and myself shows that, you know, more than half of stranded assets in a low-carbon transition to a world that's consistent with global warming of no more than 2 degrees Celsius, more than half of these assets are likely to end up ultimately on the balance sheet of investors based in OECD countries. And the largest part of these investments are made by people in the United States. Again, you know, that's uh, your and my retirement fund there. Okay, so why is that? There are three reasons for this. First, these oil companies, you know, even if you invest in them in New York at the stock exchange, 
they're active around the world, right? ExxonMobil, actually, in 2021, two-thirds of their crude oil production occurred outside the United States, and one-third of its natural gas liquids production occurred outside the United States. So the profit that Exxon makes for its investors are actually created in precisely these faraway countries. Second reason is that the financial investors in themselves are invested in foreign companies. European and US investors have 10 trillion profits in foreign equity positions, and part of these are in the oil and gas sector. So even if production is abroad, even if it's carried out by a foreign company, part of the stranded assets will still end up with investors in this part of the world. You know, just think of the big asset managers like BlackRock or the Norwegian Pension Fund. They are literally invested in every stock market listed company in the world. And the third reason is that some of the most attractive assets are out of reach. The ones that can extract oil and gas at the least cost. It so happens that many of these assets are owned by state-owned companies. Now, a state-owned company is owned by the state, so it can't be owned and give profits to private investors. Let me give you this example of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Aramco, the state-owned company, uh, has the right to, to produce oil and gas there. And it turns out that it's very cheap to produce oil in Saudi Arabia. The break-even price, that is all the money you need to cover all your costs of getting the the oil out, it's just $15 on average per barrel. It's a lot more costly in the United States. It costs $40 per barrel. So when the demand for oil declines, as it should under low carbon transition, it's the US oil wells that are going to go offline first. Okay? So most of these stranded assets, in one way or another, find their way to the balance sheets of investors in mostly the United States, and Europe and other OECD countries. And of course, they are investing on behalf on people like you and me through our retirement funds. And if you have pretty rich friends, you know, they also have a big stake in that because they have to put their investment somewhere. Now, look, the bad news is this has huge financial risks. But the good news is this also creates an opportunity. The United States and Europe can solve the largest part of excess oil and supply between themselves if they cooperate. So how to seize this opportunity? Well, first of all, you really want to expand credible investment opportunities in green sectors so that investors can go somewhere else with their money. Second, you want to make it much less attractive to hold investments in fossil fuel companies. But beautifully, that is a nice complement to something that investors can do, activist investment. So let me spell this out in detail. So clearly, we want to expand um, um, green sector investments, and we need an all-hands-on-deck approach by the government to do this, you know, by regulators, by the legislatures, incentivize investments, turbocharge public investments, um, make it easier for, to get permitting and deal bundling done, introduce green taxonomies, etc. There's a lot of research out there, including by my team, that this would unlock a lot more investment domestically and internationally. Simultaneously, you really want to make it less attractive to hold investments in fossil fuels, at least if the companies producing them don't have a strategy to move beyond their core focus. That can be done with such measures as reducing subsidies, introducing standards such as for fuel economy, hiking carbon prices, and in the short run, one has also got the option to impose windfall taxes on those high profits on oil and gas that are not reinvested in the low-carbon transition. Beautifully, all of this actually boosts an additional force, and those are activist investors. Last year, a small activist hedge fund called Engine Number no. 1 placed three directors on ExxonMobil's 12-director board, and these three directors have the aim of aligning ExxonMobil with a low-carbon future. Engine number one managed to convince enough other investors to vote with them for this change, for this resolution. Also last year, a Dutch court ordered Anglo-Dutch oil major Shell to increase their low-carbon ambitions because whatever they had put in their business plan wasn't good enough. That was because activist investors had argued successfully before the court that Shell's strategy wasn't in line with their in, in interest in having you know, a high-valued company way, way out in the future. So as more and more climate policies are introduced, as uh, 
low carbon technologies get better and better, this business case for activist investors only get, gets stronger and stronger. Now, do you know how much of a company you need to own to start such a case? One third? 25%? Less? Well, engine number one, that hedge fund at ExxonMobil, actually owned 0.02% of the company. So the challenge really is you, you can introduce a resolution with just a few shares. The challenge is to convince more than 50% of shareholders that what you're saying makes sense. So what can we all do? Well, students. I want students to go ask the university endowment, how are they voting at these shareholder meetings? I want employees to ask their retirement fund investment officer how they are voting or whether they're talking to their asset manager. If you are fortunate enough to own direct shares in an oil or gas company, go check if you can vote on one of these resolutions. You can, if they exist. And don't forget to talk to your rich friends because they own most of the shares. In this business, it's one share, one vote. Now, in this low carbon transition, changing oil and gas companies is crucial. It's not a foregone conclusion, but shareholders can make the difference. Thank you very much.